Hi, this is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of May 13th, 2019. The weekly top three is a regular weekly segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly on Tuesday's show from 6.20 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, and SoundCloud pages, and on my website at bgkeithley.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, we discuss the Budget Conference Committee, what it's doing, and where we are headed after it finishes its work. Second, we take on a news minor op-ed, which editorializes on courage, yet shows none itself. And third, we discuss a Rasmussen board editorial, which argues that the state needs more time to deal with budget cuts, even though it's had since 2013 to prepare. And now, let's join Michael. Uh, we're going to deal with what's going on out there, including uh, three things. We start off with the conference committee, Brad. And for me, it's uh, it's never a good. It's like you know, it's like that Mark Twain saying, "Whenever, only be afraid when the legislature's in session," because um, the conference committee just inexorably seems to always make the budget go up, not down. Yeah, it's a, it's an interesting phenomena. Both the both the House budget and the Senate budget. We're at the end of the day, we're within $2 million uh, of each other, a, a, an, in, an infinite, um, infinitely small uh, percentage of each other. But they differed in how they got, got to that number. The, the Senate, for example, made a big cut in, in uh, Medicaid. Uh, the House budget made a, bigger, made a big cut in the reimbursement, uh, bond reimbursement to local government. So the conference committee meets, and the choices that the conference committee have um, unless they go to free conference, which they haven't yet, the choices are either um, one side or the other, one one position or the other. And so you can you can if if you choose the higher of from each, uh, because they differ on the components, you end up with a higher budget uh, than either one of them passed uh, passed alone. And that that seems to be the direction they're going uh, in right now. For example. Uh, a very small example, but uh, on the university, the Senate cut, I think, $10 million out of the university's request. The House cut $5 million out of the university's request. Um, and the and the conferees yesterday, uh, I think it was yesterday, picked the uh, the university, uh, the House version, um, which is, uh, excuse me, the Senate version, which is a $5 million cut instead of the House's $10 million cut. On the um, school reimbursement, the House cut, um, uh, half of the school reimbursement, which would be about $100 million. The, um, uh, the Senate uh, did a full reimbursement to, uh, to the uh, uh, localities for, uh, for school reimbursement. The conferees chose the Senate version. So that, that, uh, that was the higher of the two, the, the full reimbursement. And they're going through this. It's hard to track exactly where they are at any given moment because the, the, the way that the data is presented doesn't really enable that. Right. Uh, but but the sense I have is that they're gradually stair stepping uh, the budget in a way that it will end up higher uh, than uh, than either the spending budget uh, higher than either of the uh, two houses uh, came to uh, on their own. Not by much. Uh, the 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 prediction that that I saw yesterday was that they would still cut cut. Uh, Two hundred million dollars from where they started, which was not Governor Dunleavy's proposal, but the the uh, sort of the old Walker proposal. Um, but it's still, but they're still stair stepping it up. So anybody who who hoped uh, that the conference committee would would take another deep cut, another deep dive 
uh, and getting spending down. Uh, anybody who hoped that is 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 sadly sadly disappointed. And historically, this is a. I mean, this is no surprise to you and I uh, or anybody who's really been following these things because historically, this is what happens: compromise always leads to an increase. Um, because you, I mean, you never see a. I mean, you almost never see a race to the bottom with a compromise, right? It's like, you know, who can cut the most? It's like, no, it's got to be give and take. Like, I'll give you this, but you've got to give me that. And that really is the devil is in the details of those things. It is. And, you know, it's it's disappointing in this sense. The le- all, all the legislators said we recognize that that, that we, this is we, we've got a paradigm shift that we have to that, that things are not getting better. We've, we've tapped the PFD or we've tapped the permanent fund and we're still in the hole um, and, and that we've got to got to cut costs. So they all came in with that attitude. And, and now we're getting toward the end game. Uh, all the special interests have pushed back. The university uh, has gone full tilt uh, pushing back. Uh, and, and now we're seeing, you know, sort of the sort of the the results of that in terms of the budget can, starting to creep back up from where they where they had made made those cuts. What this is really setting up. I mean, I I, I had hoped that the legislature would 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 get in there and really uh, uh, go deep dive in terms of in terms of making cuts. And, and as I've said all along through this session, to me, the canary in the coal mine. To me, the, the 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 one that tells you whether they're doing it or not is the university budget. Uh, the university is spending more than twice uh, the national average. We're funding the university more than twice the national average uh, in terms of state funding of, of state universities. Um, the Dunleavy budget proposed to bring it all the way down to 150 percent of the national average. They didn't even bring it down to the national average. They brought, they proposed to bring it down to 150 <laughs> percent, and 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 and. The two bodies uh, were like two, 235 and 240, I think, uh, were the numbers in terms of the funding. We're going to end up at 235, 235% uh, of, the, of the national average. So they really, they have not made the effort. I mean, they will, they will talk a good game. They'll tell you how hard they've tried. They'll tell you the cuts they've made in, in Medicaid. Those cuts could have been had seven years ago, by the way. But but the cuts they've made in Medicaid and and some of the other things they've done. But but the the one where you can really judge it on the university, they're they're barely making a dent, right. um, and it's really disappointing. So it's really, I mean, to some degree, you can say they've just given up, and they're going to hand it over to the governor and let the governor uh, make the deep cuts. Uh, with the red pen uh, through the veto power, and then it's going to be up to the governor and 16 members of the legislature, which uh, have to vote to uphold those vetoes, uh, to really set the budget for this year. This is this is sort of now we're sort of now in Kabuki theater. So, well, the conference committee conference committee members can go home and say, I tried, I tried to keep your budget up. Isn't that what uh, they've always done though? I mean, isn't it always Kabuki theater? I mean, isn't it always like this voodoo? Uh, this voodoo budgeting that we've talked about in the past where they, you know, they talk a good game. They talk about how they cut, cut, cut. But what they're only telling you is maybe it's UGF or DGF. They don't tell you about the actual spend. They don't tell you what the actual draw is. They tell you how hard it was to cut. And then you find out in the end that they actually increase the budget by $500 million. I mean, come on. is You know, isn't this all at this point just kind of a shell game? Yeah, but Michael, we're, yes, yes, it is. And, and what's, what's disappointing is... We're we're seven years, eight years into this into this uh, uh, overspending, into into imbalanced budgets, into drawing from savings to to support our spending habit. We're we're seven years into this, and and you know it, and and they all said, all of them said that they're going to come down there and they're going to they're going to get the budget down to the to the to the bare bones, and and we aren't even close to the bare bones. Again, you can look at the university. That's the that's if you want to focus on one thing to tell you what they're doing, look at the university, 250 percent of the national average. And, and they haven't even they haven't even gotten on that. So it's uh, it's disappointing. Yes, it's what they always do. But it's it's especially disappointing that we're that we're that we're in, seven years into this and and they're still doing it. Brad Keithley is our guest, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Uh, Brad, I remember our very first conversation. And I don't know if you do, but I always remember it because I remember this. I remember we were talking about the ICER report. It was, uh, sh- you know, shortly after that the, the update had been released and everything. And we we were talking about how 
Uh, you know, ICER had put out the sustainable budget number, and at that point, it was four point. I think it was four point two or four point three billion dollars a year, and it was only going to go down from there because the further you went out, the the least it, the less it had to be to be sustainable. And that we were all talking about how all the politicians all said, all agreed, nodded their heads. Oh yes, that's the number that we need to hit, no matter what. We agree, we're in agreement with ICER, and then we watched person after person who then said, "Well, I'm all for cuts down." to that 4.3 billion dollar level but just not in my backyard um yeah I mean, exa- we've been talking about this since the first time you and i talked yep scott goldsmith used to come out with the with the sustainable budget number did an annual report uh very well thought out uh it, I, I can i can take you back one one more step the 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 republicans returned to control of the senate in 2012 in the election of 2012 um and then they met, uh, they replaced the bipartisan Senate, and then they met in the fall uh, or in December uh, after the election uh, of 2012 to get their priorities together. They had the top three priorities. The, the number three of those priorities was uh, develop a sustainable budget, uh, uh, pass a sustainable budget. Kathy Giesel uh, spoke at a conference that I chaired uh, shortly after that, and she was all over sustainable budget. Um, and that was exactly where she was going to press. And she said, the Senate will do this. The Republicans will do this. We're back in control. Uh, and we're going to, we're going to, we're going to do this. And then I remember going to, uh, speaking before the Senate caucus, I was invited to speak before the, the Republican caucus in the Senate. And I, and I went through, and I went through the presentation. I said, okay, this is what you need to do. This is, these are the steps you need to take. This is the number you're driving toward. If you get toward this number, we'll have a sustainable budget going forward. And I, and I, and I'll, I'll never forget the conversation I had with the then Senate president, Charlie Hughes after, um, or Charlie Higgins after, I'm sorry, Charlie Higgins after. Um, and he said, yeah, we'll get there in about three or four years. <laughs> we're, we're, we're going to put this on a glide path to, to, to get yeah. it down. Yeah. Uh, and and they never did. I mean, it, it glided up actually yeah. from from there. Continues so, to do so. I mean, that is just the nature of government, and nobody seems to really want to acknowledge that. That is the nature of government, and it is our job as citizens, as advocates, to continue to try and keep that downward pressure. It's almost inexorable. It's like that rock at the top of the hill that's just going to crush everything in its path, and all we can do is hold it back. That's what's going on. <laughs> So there's there's two more things on the on the the, the conference committee uh, that are important to follow. One is we, we they still have not addressed this proposed transfer from the earnings reserve account that the Senate proposed and the House has talked about of uh, the Senate's number is 13 billion dollars to the uh, to the permanent fund corpus. The House number uh, it, that they discuss in the House Finance is about eight billion dollars. There is a great uh, uh, editorial today, op-ed in on the editor on the opinion page of the Anchorage Daily News, authored by Roger Marks, um, and the title of it is "Senate Plan Puts Alaska at Risk of Blowing Up," um, and 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 that's not a good thing. Blowing up is not a good thing when you're talking about fiscal matters, and Roger does a, a great job of walking through the potential consequences uh, of of the Senate's proposed transfer of 13 billion dollars, essentially. Now that we've drained the CBR, uh, the Constitutional Budget Reserve, which was sort of our fiscal backstop that we had uh, to fund uh, uh, occasional uh, uh, deficits that we might have, now that we've drained that, the earnings reserve accounts really the only fiscal back- backup this state has. If we lost taps for an extended period of time, or now that we're using the earnings uh, or off the permanent fund, if, if the market went down for an extended period of time, uh, we don't have any fiscal back- backup, any savings backup other than the earnings reserve. And and Roger does a great job in that editorial, uh, important for listeners to read, a great job in that editorial walking through the potential consequences uh, to the state of draining that that remaining backup. Uh, and putting it into the into the into the corpus. The and second I've, thing and is, I've, uh, I, and I've dropped the link to that uh, editorial. By the way, is in the chat room right now at facebookcom slash Show. Sorry, Brad. Go ahead. No, no great. Uh, and the second thing to watch for is the permanent fund dividend amount. The conference committee has not yet uh, hit that. Tammy Wilson said yesterday uh, that that she favors addressing the permanent fund dividend outside of the conference committee. Through some separate legislature, through them some separate legislation, we're 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 the day before the end of the legislature, right? The 120 days runs tomorrow, 
Um, and and if if we're talking about addressing the dividend through separate legislation, I'm not sure what time frame she has in mind. Uh, it's a special uh, session, no matter what. It's a special session after midnight tomorrow night. It's a special session. Yeah, exactly. So I um, that was that was confusing, frankly, to see uh, uh, that statement. I know the House has said that all along, but they've never advanced legislation that would deal with the dividend. So I'm I. I I, I didn't know. I, I don't know what they have in mind about doing that through legislation. The Senate certainly has done it in the budget. Um, if we don't do it in the budget, we are off to special session. Absolutely. Uh, Harold says the state will have plenty of liquidity. 20, I think he's saying 2020 cash is projected to be over $7 billion. Brad, your thoughts? Well, $7 billion sounds like a lot. Uh, but if you if we lose taps for an extended period or if we have a market downturn or perish the thought, both happen at the same time. Uh, that $7 billion, we've, we've, we've blown through, keep in mind, we've blown through $18 billion in seven years, just like, you know, like a knife through butter. So it sounds like a lot, but that $7 billion also has to account for um, uh, the permanent fund draw and the, the, the draw for both the permanent fund dividend uh, and government in following years. The, the, a good rule of thumb uh, for these type of things is to have in reserve, especially for a government that's as dependent on a single commodity or a single revenue source uh, as we are, is to have three times uh, your, your cash requirements uh, on hand in a reserve. Uh, if you adopt the Senate's plan, uh, the last numbers I saw is we're like at 1.8 times um, uh, in terms of of cash on hand to uh, to cash requirements or to reserves to cash requirements, um, and even if you adopt the Senate or the House plan, the eight billion dollars, we're still well below three. So I, there's there is some um, uh, excess above three three times that you can transfer over. I think the numbers between four and five billion dollars uh, that you can transfer over and uh, and still maintain that sort of reserve. But but we are down to our last reserve. Uh, we've blown through the SBR, the statutory budget reserve. We've blown through the constitutional budget reserve, and we're down to our last fiscal reserve. And it's important to keep to keep that reserve. Absolutely. I mean, you've got to have it uh, just for the. I mean, again, the cash flow situation. And like like you said, seven billion, six seven billion may seem like a lot until some kind of crisis happens, and then you realize that that's, you know, barely a year, maybe a year and a half's worth of actual run. I mean, it, for, if you're looking for full reserves, that's that's like like a year's worth of money needed to run the state of Alaska with any kind of slush left over. It's not a comforting thought. You have a number that you have in mind, because again, this is not a bad idea, but it all depends on the amount of money that we're talking about being transferred. What is, in your mind, the ideal amount that should be transferred into the Corpus for Protection? Well, in the numbers I've run previously, I've always thought that $6 billion, holding $6 billion in reserve, uh, or the $6 billion transfer, excuse me, uh, uh, would be would be the, about the right amount of money. But that's that's dependent on getting spending down. I mean, I, I'm, I'm really focused on the three times uh, factor. So, so that $6 billion was really dependent on getting spending down uh, to, a, to a much lower level than where we're headed. We may still get there. Uh, in, ter in terms of the of the reductions that Governor Dunleavy is hopefully going to take through vetoes, and hopefully will be upheld, we may still get down to the level where uh, a six billion dollar transfer would be would would still provide the three times uh, reserve number, um, and and I'm hopeful we do. And 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 if 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 we get that spending down, then that's probably the right number to uh, uh, to transfer. But but it's it it's dependent on. How much spending we end up with? I think I, I, the simple way to think about it is just three times. Three times cash requirements. That's what we need to keep in reserve. Uh, historically, we've kept above that. Uh, uh, you have to go back like nine years or eight years uh, to, uh, to to find a time that we were below that. Uh, the last several years, even with uh, even with the deficit spending we've been engaged in, we've we've kept a reserve higher than three times. So that's really the number that that we need to drive at. 
Brad Keithley is our guest, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Uh, Brad, we've got about just less than a minute, but I do want to touch on this. And I mentioned it earlier, and I was a little uh, jokingly and tongue-in-cheek, but I was talking about Senate Bill 24, 23 and 24 and the and the public commentary. And Natasha von Imhoff was running the meeting. Um, and it, first of all, this was a very short-notice meeting. Uh, everybody had to be signed up before the meeting to even testify, yada, yada, yada. And I'll be honest with you, uh, it was pretty eye-opening to see the first two or three people were testifying in favor of taking the PFD and spending on state government. And then it was just a tsunami of people that were lambasting the legislature for even thinking about taking this. Uh, Natasha Von Imhoff got so heated that she actually stormed out of the meeting. But what does this say to you about the way Alaskans are feeling about this overall? you got about 40 seconds. Well... I, it, that's that's telling you that Alaskans want to preserve the PFD. The the chamber uh, poll that that you talked about early uh, today, and we'll talk about uh, uh, later on. Uh, the chamber poll is telling you the same thing. It's telling you the majority of Alaskans want to preserve the PFD, and the majority of Alaskans want. The put in the constitution i think this this is important enough to pick up uh jeff landfield uh named natasha von imhoff his loose unit of the week which if you haven't followed his blog it's hysterical where he points out kind of this ridiculous uh behavior from certain legislators um von imhoff got the uh got the nod this week because she stormed out of the senate finance meeting on sb 23 and 24 after the public testimony just became a tsunami against uh, the legislature for cutting into the PFD. And Brad, I just want your thoughts on this because to me, this gives us a temperature in the room of what Alaskans really think. And you didn't really get a chance to flush that out so quickly, if we can, before we jump into two and three. What What are your thoughts on that? Well, I, I think I think that was a that was sort of an unstructured moment, right? A lot of this testimony has been published in advance. Uh, the The special interests have been able to to gear up their forces. The 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 K through twelve. Uh, 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 forces, the university forces, the Medicaid forces, healthcare forces, they've all been able to gather up their forces and sort of sort of get everybody ginned up to, to make comments. This one wasn't structured like that. It sort of popped up on uh, on very short notice. The special interests weren't able to to to, to get the word out and gear up their all of their uh, all of their uh, uh, usual force to, to speak against these things. Um, and so it was it was it was much more an unstructured, hey, this is what we really think uh, moment. And and you're right. I mean, people after person after person after person called in uh, to complain about the way the legislature is uh, is treating the PFD. And, uh, and Natasha, uh, Senator Von Imhoff, shown, showed her true colors. If she can't if she if she couldn't have it structured, uh, so that so that she got all of her uh, uh, all of her allies to to call in and 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 get them, uh, she got she got very upset about it yeah. and and having to confront uh, true Alaskans about it. Yeah, absolutely. All right, let's move into number two of the weekly top three: the News Miners Editorial Board and their uh, well, their lack of courage. Let's put it that way. <laughs> so the News Miner ran this editorial over the weekend uh, that's headlined. Uh, Alaska can't afford a big PFD. Legislators must have courage to reject a big payout. And essentially, it goes through uh, the, the the typical analysis of, hey, we've, we, we're, we're, we're spending all this money. It's needed services. It's, it's, it's important to keep Alaska uh, operating the way it has been operating. Uh, we don't have enough money to do it. Uh, the PFD is, is, after all, government money. And so we just need to cut the PFD uh, in order to fund it. And legislators need to have the courage to step up uh, and uh, and reject uh, a big payout of the PFD. We need to legislators just need to have the courage to to cut it and uh, put it uh, uh, toward government spending. And there's there's not one mention during during this editorial or frankly any other editorial the news miner has been running on the subject the last year of the impact, the, the distributional impact that has on middle and lower income Alaska families. They've never recognized, never recognized the disproportionate impact that the PFD cuts have on middle and lower income Alaska families as opposed to the top 20 percent. Uh, and they've never recognized uh, uh, the PFD uh, as, as, as a source of, of income, as a source of, 
uh, as a source of, of, of the people's share, the, the citizen share um, of the of the wealth in the in the fashion that the governor Hammond talked it about talked about it. They just they've always recognized it as, as government income. So you know they're talking about well you just have to have you just have to have courage. Legislators you just have to have courage to go in there and make these PFD cuts. If I, I, I'll, I'll tell you in my opinion the one that lacks courage is the is the Fairbanks News Miner editorial board. They need to step up and recognize the distributional impact uh, of, of what PFD cuts uh, have. They need to recognize the disproportionate and the huge impact that PFD cuts have, that that tax has on, on middle and lower income Alaska families. They need to recognize the impact that has on the overall Alaska economy. And they need to talk about if we're going to continue this spending, they need to talk about other more equitable, more efficient ways uh, uh, to do this spending. PFD cuts put the entire burden on Alaska families that we don't tax, we don't reach non-residents at all with PFD cuts. The entire burden is put on Alaska families. That raises the amount, we, we, could, we could get 7%, up to 7% or perhaps more from non-residents if we included them um, in the tax. But because we don't do that, that entire burden is shifted to uh, to Alaska families and shifted to middle and lower income Alaska families. This, the news miner needs to step up and do that and recognize that disproportionate impact and recognize that we're leaving non-resident income off the table. We're not including it. And they need to have the courage to say, okay, if we're going to have to raise revenues, then we need to put more equitable, more equitably we need to ensure all Alaskans are being burdened to the same extent, not that some are paying much more than others, and we need to go out and get non-resident income. That's that's where courage that's where the courage steps in, recognizing that if we're going to have this excess spending, we need to get all Alaskans bearing the cost equitably, and we need to get non-residents bearing a proportion of the cost as well. No one's no one has stepped up to do that because it takes courage to do it. it takes courage to talk about getting an equitable an equitable uh, tax system uh, in place. It it what what is really the lack of courage, almost the cowardice the way out is to say, oh, let's just go take middle and lower income Alaska families' income um, and cut the PFD and 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 use that to support uh, use that to support government. It's you know it's 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 super frustrating, but that's exactly what the mantra has been from the other side is just you know we've got to cut this to support government no matter what, and uh, and and we just can't make these cuts. They're just too much true draconian, and it's it's really tough. Um, let's um, let's continue on uh, unless you're done with that to move on to number three. We got about four and a half minutes here. Sure, let's go to three. All right, so in three, we're going to talk a little bit about the Rasmussen Foundation, which, of course, is one of the largest philanthropic organizations in the state. They provide about a quarter of the uh, they provide about a quarter of the philanthropic private philanthropic giving across the state of Alaska, and they're saying this can't all be done at once. We need to stair step it. We need to take our time. Otherwise, uh, these all these nonprofits that are supposed to step up to the plate just wouldn't have enough time to recover. What say you? Well. <laughs> this is this is another ongoing frustration. We've been in this situation since 2013. We've been running deficits since 2013. Since 2013, we've gone through roughly 18 billion dollars of our savings. Uh, we we gave back two billion dollars through PFD cuts, so a net of 16 billion dollars. We've gone through a net of 16 billion dollars in our savings since 2013. It's not been a shocker that we've been that we've been you know. Uh, on this track for the past seven years. Maybe the first couple of years, uh, we could tell ourselves, oh, this is temporary. We're going to work our way out of it. Maybe the third year, even, you could bring that up, uh, uh, talk about it being temporary. But we're seven years into it. And for somebody to now claim, and the university is doing the same thing, uh, for somebody to now claim, oh, my gosh, you mean we're in a deficit and I'm going to have to spend less? I'm going to have to take cuts? Oh, wow. well, give me some time to think about it. And think about how I do that. I mean, the the, the University Board of, uh, of Regents had that meet, had a meeting last week in which they sort of adopted that very attitude. We need a task force to figure out how we're gonna to figure out how we're gonna make cuts. <laughs> Baloney, I heard this back. I heard these same things back in 2014, 2015, 2016. 2016 is a is a watershed because Tammy Wilson then you know inserted language into the 
into the uh, uh, the budget bill that said uh, to the university, you need to you need to straighten up. You need to get a plan for how you're going to reduce costs. And each time they said, "Oh yeah, we're going to study that. We're going to we're going to get a task force together. <laughs> the Alaska work on that. The Alaska study industry. We need a study to study the study that we previously studied before with another study group that we need to study one more time. I mean, it's just yeah. it's an institution in the state. Yeah, it's. I, I mean, I borrowed a hashtag when I when I posted this. The times up hashtag. It, we're, we've done enough of this. I mean, the university. You've had a, enough time to figure out what you're going to do. Um, uh, groups like the Rasmussen Foundation. You've had enough time to figure out what you're going to do. We've been in this situation for seven years. It's time to make these cuts. I I'm not falling for this excuse anymore. Of oh, we need. Oh gosh, you really. We really need to make cuts. Well, I guess I'm going to have to study that. I'm not going to fall for that anymore. <laughs> it is time to make the cuts. You'll figure out how to do it. And I know from experience, looking back at 2016 and other times, you're not going to make those cuts until cuts are actually made. So, wow. I, no sympathy. We got Brad Keithley fired up this morning. That's a first. I'm pretty excited about that. <laughs> Man, let's get Brad spun up a little bit here. This is, I mean... But I mean, you're right, Brad. I mean, how much how much time do you have to see that this is staring you in the face before you start actually acting? And see, this well, is it's, beco- it's become a delaying tactic more than anything else. It's just it's it. I mean, if I hadn't been here in 2016, if I hadn't seen this before, maybe I'd buy it. But but the attitude is okay. Ignore it. Ignore it. Ignore it. Oops, can't ignore it anymore. All right, we'll tell them we're going to study it. And then, and then tell them we're studying it, and then tell them we're studying it, and then tell them, and then ignore it, and then oh shoot, they really mean it. Well, tell them we're going to study it again. I mean, it's the 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 university is just classic at that. I'm 2016. They were told point blank, to work on a plan to consolidate, work on a plan to do the, work on a plan to get your costs down. And they went for about a year, and they had a task force, and they started talking about it. And then they came up with a bunch of excuses, and you know the NCAA wouldn't let us consolidate or wouldn't let us keep our athletic teams if we consolidated campuses, and you know all sorts of other stuff. And and then it just sort of, you know, they sort of ignored it for a while, ignored it for a while, and it seemed to go away. And and look at look at how it's worked for them. I mean, they're still getting a three hundred and fifteen million dollar budget. They're still getting yep. two hundred and fifty percent of the national average. Right. I can't blame them. I can't blame them for for that stall tactic if that's if that's their objective. But by gosh, there comes a time that you got to take action, and we're and we're we're at the time, right? We're out of time, time's well, because up. Because it keeps working. That's why they keep doing it because it keeps working. If we stall, then people forget about it, and then we can thing, and then other things pop up, and we can just continue to move on, and we can tell you how we need more money and blah 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 blah. I mean, you're a hundred percent right. It is just a stall tactic so they can keep the spending at the levels that they want. I mean, that's and what it's hope, all about. And they hope people forget about it. They hope the pressure goes someplace else, and and they can dodge it another time. I. You know, 2016 was a was to me was a watershed. The language, and I and I'm disappointed that Tammy Wilson isn't making this point because it was her language that was in the budget. Right, right. Uh, but but 2016 was a watershed. We we got to that point. We said, all right, it's time to make cuts. Here's here's what you need to do. You need to get ready for this. And they just they just stalled it out. So you know, fool me once, shame on me. <laughs> fool me twice, uh uh-uh. uh. My friend. <laughs> we're, we're, we're getting it done. My friend John Reeves talks about the Alaska study industry. He's like, it's a whole industry. They've got libraries full of studies from previous studies that they've done before where they're going to study everything to death. He goes, it's a multi-million dollar industry in this state. He goes, we need, we've just got to eliminate it. And he's right. I mean, that's the thing. We've got a whole industry built up around the idea of studying something. We've done a whole lot of studying and a whole lot of non-acting on most of these things. And it's just, it's just frustrating to the extreme um the final thoughts here brad we're down to the last we got about two and a half three minutes here but i want to uh give you a chance to summate anything that the folks need to be doing paying attention to what do we need to get going on here uh as we get down to the last day essentially of the regular session we know that it's going to be special session because of education and everything else but your thoughts here on the last of the last little bit i i think i think continuing to contact legislators continuing 
uh, to uh, to let them know your thoughts. Your legislator, not 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 every legislator in the book, but your legislator who will who will listen to you. Let them know your thoughts on the PFD and on things like the proposed uh, transfer of money out of the earnings reserve to the permanent fund. Let them know. We saw in the last election cycle with Ron Gillum and Peter Maciecki that that those things ultimately have an impact. And if legislators are paying attention uh, uh, about what happened to Maciecki and Maciecki's con conversion, uh, they know that that they may be in for the very same thing if they don't pay attention. So let them know what you're thinking, um, and and that's the that's the best any of us can do uh, to keep to keep that pressure on. And and we need to keep it on even with the conference committee. We need to keep it on through the through the special session if they don't resolve uh, these issues, and then we need to keep it on once the governor makes the uh, makes the 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 vetoes the line item vetoes. We need to keep it on through uh, uh, through the the process that the legislature will go through about evaluating those vetoes and potential overrides. Just keep it every, you know every time an issue comes up, write that letter, make that call, send that email to your legislator and let them know what you think. Well, I got to tell you, uh, I think it is working in a lot of ways. Every member of the minority we've talked to has been in support of the vetoes, uh, said that they will support it. I mean, some of them conditionally, but for the most part, they're all behind it. Um, but that's where the rubber's going to meet the road, because I think this is going to come down to the governor having to veto. I don't think he's going to go anywhere near where his original budget was, but I think he's going to, I mean, because that was a conversation starter, but I think that this is going to be the way it is. And if we do have the seven in the Senate that Machiki talked about, which surprised the hell out of me, uh, if we do have the seven in the Senate, six or seven, and we've got, you know, close to the 15 in the House with a minority, I think we've got this sewed up. It, it, then it'll just be a knockdown drag out. But I think that this education fight is going to take us right to a constitutional crisis, quite honestly. Uh, 90 seconds, Brad, your thoughts. Oh, I think the governor's right on the on, on the education. I agree. Attitude. Yeah. I mean, bas basically, what everybody's arguing is one governor, the, or those on the opposite side are arguing one governor can bind the other. Well, the, cost, the, the Supreme Court has told us one legislature can't bind another. I can't think that it's a different rule for the governor. So yeah. Yeah. I what, think the governor's right on that. What's stopping the legislature from forward funding education for four years of a next governor's term and the governor never gets a bite at that apple, never gets a chance to weigh in? No, that's totally unconstitutional. I mean, I can yeah. that just on its face, that's obviously unconstitutional. But we're going to be facing at this summer, I'm sure that'll be one of the things that'll be brought up. If they don't get this, Senate now has pushed back the crime bill because it's going to cost $100 million to implement. So, I mean, we're going to, we're facing facing a lot of issues here and nobody wants to do the thing that needs to be done which is cut the government and that's that's the unfortunate part brad keithley alaskans for a sustainable budget brad my friend thank you so much for coming on this morning michael as always thanks for having me appreciate it thank you so much well that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from alaskans for sustainable budgets thank you again for joining us remember that you can find past episodes on our youtube and soundcloud pages and keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.